This painting is the Garden of Earthly Delights. It was first described by the Italian storyteller Antonio de Beatis, who saw it in the palace of the Kants of Nassau in Brussels. The fact that it stands in a palace confirms that this triptych, if we want to be technically correct, is a commissioned work. This work is considered by historians a concept of damnation and madness. Having said this, the work must have caused something of a sensation with its viewing audience, since it was copied both in painting and tapestry after its creator's death in 1516. On this episode of History of Renaissance, we will discuss the controversial personality and life of Hieronymus Bosch. Before we begin, like our video and subscribe to our channel to watch more history of art and history of cinema videos. Let's start. On this episode, we will leave Italy and travel north to the Netherlands. During the 14th century, Holland was very different from what it is today. Having survived numerous floods and storms during the previous century, which created new lakes and inland seas, as well as the sinking of land in most places that literally changed its geography, the Netherlands had somehow stabilized in the early 1400s. We can't yet call it a country, as at the time it was just a league of independent states, each with specific tradition and diverging interests. The real big towns and trade centers were still to be found in the southern Netherlands, Antwerp, Brussels, Ghent, Bruges, all in Belgium and Lille in France. One of the most active cities at the time was Hertogenbosch, the capital of the province of North Brabant. This is the city where Jerome van Eyken, known as Hieronymus Bosch, was born sometime in 1450. Little is known about Jerome's childhood, as there are no clues except some local records. It is known that he came from an artistic family, as all of his brothers, father and uncle were painters, and he was trained by one of them. In 1463, 4,000 houses in Hertogenbosch were devastated by a fire, an event that most probably influenced and traumatized Jeroen, and it is said to have inspired his works and the way they would look. According to some municipal records, in 1475, Jeroen is named as a member of his father's studio, and it is thought that his father and probably one of his uncles instructed him to paint. Sometime between 1480 and 1481, he married the daughter of a trader, named Aleid van den Merven. Although Aleid was older than him, she was the heir to a large inheritance, which included a family estate in the nearby town of Oirschot, where the couple resided. Bosch benefited from the wealth and property that came with his marriage, and soon he opened his own workshop. By this time, he was well established as an artist and had developed ties with royalty and powerful sponsors. A mention of his name and occupation appeared in the municipal records of Hertogenbosch in 1486, labeling him as a distinguished painter. Because of the fact that Hertogenbosch was under the occupation of Roman Empire, it is probable that Jerome was familiar with the Renaissance art that was inspiring the Flemish painters at the time. In 1488, he was admitted in the Brotherhood of Our Lady, an Orthodox Catholic organization made up of around 40 of Hertogenbosch's powerful individuals, as well as 7,000 outside members spread across Europe. While it is believed that his first commissions came from the Brotherhood, none of his early works survive. The first important work chronologically that we know is Crucifixion with Saints and Honor, from 1490. The work depicts the scene of the crucifixion with the Virgin and St. John the Evangelist. Also, there is a detailed landscape behind the characters which supports them. Unfortunately, the patron for this painting is not known. He can only be seen, however, on the front wearing an elegant attire with St. Peter leaning in behind him. Many believe that St. Peter gives a hint to the man's name, but it's mostly speculation. What is also significant about this work is that it is a standard painting which shows that not all of the artist's work was about nightmarish creatures as in the Garden of Earthly Delights. Dated 10 years later, around 1500s, the seven deadly sins and the four last things 
is a work which is more characteristic of Bosch's style. Painted on the top of a wooden table, the painting is a representation of the last four stages that the human soul goes through upon death, discussed clockwise starting at the top left. In short, those are death, judgment, heaven and hell. In the center is an image of Christ emerging from his grave with the text, Beware, beware, the Lord sees. Made in 1503, the Garden of Earthly Delights is Hieronymus' most famous and recognized work. According to art historians and texts from that time, the triptych is believed to have been a gift for the wedding of Henry III of Nassau Breda and Bosch intended it to be both a guide to the positives of marriage as well as something to simply entertain the eye. There is evidence to suggest that the triptych was on display at the Brussels Palace of the Nassau family and this is how we can estimate the exact year of its creation. Regarded as his most complicated and puzzling work, the Garden of Earthly Delights represents the main fears that dominated people during the Middle Ages. The weakness of people to resist sin and the eternal damnation. Bosch's work is full of fantastical beasts, strange landscapes and depictions of evil deeds caused by humans. On the left we can see a depiction of the Garden of Eden, Hell on the right and the human world in the middle. The right panel is the most terrifying as it depicts humanity's most atrocious acts of sin. Bosch's vision was highly fantastical with a strong moral message that made his work very popular and shocking during his time. His work, and in particular the Garden of Earthly Delights, is so important that had a main influence in the development of surrealism in the 20th century. Bosch's later works are very different in style and character. Instead of the hellish landscapes, and scary beings, he painted half-length figures pressed against a picture plane. The crowning with thorns and Christ carrying the cross is a good example of his later experimentations and development. The purpose of these paintings is to try and engage the spectator differently. The viewer would have to participate in it physically as well as psychologically. The most peaceful and serene of Bosch's mature works depict various saints in contemplation or at rest. Among those works are St. John the Evangelist on Patmos and St. Jerome in prayer. His last works show us that Bosch did not only see the evils of the world, but he had a vision of a world of beauty too. His mastery in creating color harmonies and the emotions depicted on his works that wake up the imagination rank him among the very best of history of art in general. The uniqueness of his style and techniques prevented him from having any real followers who would continue his work, like it was common with other artists, especially during the Renaissance. Hieronymus Bosch died in August 1516. A funerary service was held on the 9th of August in the church of St. John in Hertogenbosch. Today, only 25 paintings and 8 drawings survive. The main reason for this is that Protestant Reformation destroyed many works deemed immoral. Other works were confiscated or bought until eventually got lost. But Bosch's place in the history of art is beyond question. Thank you for watching our episode. If you liked it, check out our other episodes on history of Renaissance and our other series on history of cinema. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit that notification button. See you next time.